try. Amazing, so we're recording now. Um, amazing, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them now. And if not, I call upon the Honorable Prime Minister to give us a speech not exceeding eight minutes. Here, here. Okay, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Panel, during this debate, uh, we must focus on two different concepts of fiction, the positive political fiction and the negative political fiction. As positive political fiction, we mean those with moral at the end. So this, me this means that political positive fictions uh, show trust in the future as it can be changed and there is still a redemption. For example, in Fahrenheit 451, uh, there is a big teaching that books are fundamental as well as culture. On the other side, uh, negative political fiction, uh, in polit negative political fiction, pessimism is widespread. In those fictions, there is no hope in the future because the reality is shaped by the humans and humans cannot change. For example, in 1984, there was no way to escape from the regime. Therefore, the only solution was to be submitted, submitted uh, to it. During uh, this debate, uh, our team believes that both positive and negative political fictions are important and necessary for the spectator and for the reader, but they are not equally important. Firstly, we recognize, in fact, that good, good in both category, categories of fiction. In positive political fiction, we find the representation of teaching spreading trust in future and hope. We see uh, in the spread of an eager to strive for change, to work and fight for something, uh, and to rely on institutions. While the positive aspects are on the uh, so-called negative political fiction, point of information. representation of uh, one second place, representation of injustices, inequalities, of problems uh, of the real world, uh, of uh, uh, helping and stimulate uh, uh, critical thinking, and it leaves a clear memory in the spectator about something negative that could happen in the future, and that has to be solved. I'll take the POI. Do you think more people attend protests out of pure happiness or anger? About? Um, do people attend protests due to happiness or anger? Oh, protest is by definition uh, something uh, negative to protest uh, against something, uh, and otherwise there would be simply a manifestation of uh, a political thinking, but we're not talking about this now. So I told you that we recognize good in both categories of fiction, but at the same time, both categories of fiction have shown their limits that need to be overcome. As an example, politi positive political fiction uh, may be interpreted as a false reality in which everything ends well, as in American superheroes, uh, and an illusion of or an illusion of living in a world without initial issues. Well, on the other side, negative political fictions might go might uh, lead to distrust in political institutions, uh, to passivisms, to an extremization of reality, or might bring to fear that the world in which uh, free of fear of the world in which we live in. Those limits can be actually overcome by, by juxtaposing the two one another. It is so needed that the two categories exist and are largely distributed to the public, but however, they must not be distributed equally. Why? Because we believe that it should prevail a positive and truthful vision of the reality and not a disorder and untruthful, untruthful vision of reality. To exemplify what I have just argued, I would like to compare medieval times and the Renaissance. During medieval times, a negative, pessimistic, fearful vision of the world prevailed. People were afraid of death, of God, of his judgment. They did not have hope to achieve their goals in life, but only to satisfy God's requirements to reach heaven. We believe that if a negative political fiction were to prevail, the common mindset would, have, would be that of a pacifism in action, leading people not to strive for what they believe in. By comparison, on the other side, during the Renaissance, so a positive time, this fear was overcome, allowing people to have confidence in themselves, to trust their rulers, to act for their beliefs. Think about the inheritance of these two years. Medieval, medieval times are remembered as dark and horrible ages. Whistle the Renaissance evokes a luminous serenity and gives us hopes in humanity. 
we prefer a word actually as in political fiction in which optimism, no thank you in which political uh, optimism uh, prevails for what believe uh, that is optimism that we thrive positive political fiction in fact uh, must prevail over the ne negative fiction to keep trust in the future and to keep people stimulated to work for it. And this is my first argument. Uh, negative political fiction are filled with stereotypes uh, and extreme examples of society. As an example, we find in uh, 1984, uh, complete uh, media control, forced speech, catastrophes, and unreal uh, political mechanisms. And because of this, readers and spectators start to recognize those extreme, no, thank you. those extreme examples in life, even when they are not actual, actually present. This means having the feeling to live in a simulation or in a negative political fiction that uh, uh, in which all institutions are evil and are egoistic. Uh, uh, as an example, I like, I'd like to bring you the uh, one of uh, the War of the Words uh, in the 1930s, uh, um, a radio transmission uh, in, uh, the, uh, by the Columbia Broadcasting System, uh, so uh, in the region of Columbia in the United States, uh, in which uh, uh, um, fiction, uh, political fiction, uh, uh, that regarded also uh, uh, an invasion of uh, uh, Earth by aliens uh, uh, was uh, uh, set up and distributed to people. Due to this uh, uh, negative, actual dystopic uh, uh, fiction that that uh, uh, talked about, uh, as I said, uh, an invasion uh, of uh, aliens uh, in the region of Colombia that was shown as a uh, uh, news broad broadcasting uh, um, television moment, uh, uh, we saw that people actually had the reactions in their own lives. People started to panic, people started to have fear uh, to leave their homes, so people started to uh, view uh, in another way the reality. Of course, the uh, times were completely different uh, from, uh, no thank you, from uh, the hours uh, in which we live in. But actually, uh, still um, media and still fiction, uh, both uh, we can watch and both we can read, uh, have a huge impact on our lives that we have to consider. So as by definition, negative political fiction don't find a solution to reality because it is too flawed to be saved. If readers bring those thoughts into everyday life, the direct consequence would be a lack of interest in changing the mistakes in our community life because this is what those books and those films are told them to do. On the other side, so we see positive political fiction. Positive political fiction often brings a positive view of institutions, of policies, of politicians to so their stories and for members of institutions. By doing this, they also brings a positive representation of the ending of an unsolved issues. Uh, so the um, motivation for people to fight for a problem, to fight for a certain battle, to strive for something. And this is what we believe in, that uh, positive political fiction must prevail because they stimulate to work, to fight, to strive for something uh, and not uh, only uh, and not mainly have a negative representation of reality. They have a good one, they motivated people and uh, they must uh, prevail over the negative uh, for people for, to actually have uh, a truthful and uh, a good representation of the reality. This is the end of my speech, so thank you for the attention. Thank the Prime Minister for their fine speech. Uh, could the rest of the panel please signal if they're ready? Amazing, thank you. Uh, so, if everyone's ready, I call upon the leader of opposition to bring in a speech that doesn't exceed eight minutes. Here, here. My audible? Yes, you are.
Opposition throws a false strand of hope into the wind for it to be crushed by the iron fist of reality. Optimism breeds apathy. Pessimism creates action. Because the reality of our world right now is that abortion is being denied in the United States, democracies continue to backslide, and governments continue to fail, killing hundreds of thousands of people. That is the reality that this opposition must confront, and that's why we stand for more uh, for, for not optimistic texts, and instead we stand for the pessimism. So what do we stand for in this debate? We can still have optimism not in political texts, because political texts specifically, we think this is harmful for the reasons that we're going to outline in this speech. But broadly, what do we think are the features of optimistic texts? There are two. Firstly, we say that they have political problems where they exist, have easy and fast solutions, as we can see in TV shows like The West Wing. And the second feature is that we think that governments and political institutions can broadly be relied on, trusted to fix those problems. By contrast, pessimistic texts are the opposite of that. And we think that in those worlds, those are the ones that we stand for. So two questions I'm going to answer in this speech, but first let's do a bit of rebuttal. They have two key claims. Their first line of attack is to say that people become fundamentally distrustful of governments. There are two responses here. The first thing to say is that we don't think it makes you inherently distrustful. It means that you're more likely to hold those people to account, and that is something that is necessarily beneficial. It means that when you see something go wrong, you're more likely to take action against it, because you don't see that as a one-off scenario. You see it as a broader problem that needs to be fixed, and that is what we get on our side. But the second thing to say here is that even if it does make you distrustful, it's unclear why that's a huge harm in this debate, because we would rather urge on the side of caution, because the harms of not being cautious are enormous. That is totalitarian states, that is letting people get off with things that they shouldn't, and that is necessarily a harm that this opposition must face that they have not engaged with. The second line of attack that they say is that people feel hopeless. Again, two responses. Firstly, no, we say this actually strengthens your will to fight to the point where you can recognize how big those problems are because you can't rely on other people to fix them. You can't rely on the institution to do everything for you. You have to do that yourself. That necessarily means you're more likely to fight harder. The second thing to say is that if you, or you're actually more likely to feel hopeless under this opposition, if you think that's a bad thing, for the reason that you think that everything is okay, but when you are confronted with reality, that hope is crushed and it is even worse. So, in, with that in mind, two questions I'm going to answer in this speech. First, how does this affect the perception of politics? And second, how does this affect readers' suffering? Firstly, how does this affect the perception of politics? Because recognize that opposition texts encourage people to look through the world through rose-tinted glasses rather than confront the world that actually exists, which is one that is often bad. Note that clearly there are immense problems with politics this opposition does not recognize. That is polarization. That is corruption. That is misinformation, which currently happens and means that democracies continue to fail. With that in mind, we think there are three parts to this argument. Firstly, optimistic and political fiction sabotages true structural change that can happen under our side. Firstly, because it denies many of the problems that exist in the first place, which means that in political TV shows, often they don't talk about corruption existing, even though that is something that we should know about, even though that's something that happens right now. But secondly, where these problems do exist, many of these texts assume that they can be fixed without change. That's in the same way as in the West Wing, they can solve the conflict in the Middle East in three episodes, even though in real life it has not even fully finished and it's continued to go on for decades and hurt more and more people. That is the sort of thing that happens in optimistic texts that prevents real change. People going out and actually making a difference because they realize that problems are continuing and they need to be solved. The second part of this argument is to understand that by comparison, pessimistic fiction encourages structural change because it warns people what could happen and tells people about the reality that happens right now. There are three reasons why this is true. Firstly, because people feel obligated to make this change because they recognize the magnitude of the problem. They can't say that other people are going to do it for them. Every vote matters. Everything that you do matters. And that is necessarily why we get more change when the problem is perceived to be bigger. But secondly, we say that you can see, you can understand on our side that the system cannot fix itself. You cannot rely on politicians to hold each other to account cannot rely on having blind faith, and instead you have to do things yourself and make change from the ground up from the grassroots. But the third thing to say is that we feel that you feel more attached to suffering in those uh, pessimistic texts, and that's simply for the reason that it plays upon our own empathy, which means that you're more attached emotionally to these characters who have gone through that suffering, which means that you're more likely to take action. The final part of this argument is why do we think that our change yeah. on the like it to be far more sustainable. Firstly, because we say that under a proposition, the realization of the magnitude of the problem does not exist. They can say that it doesn't really happen. They can say, and they can ignore the real problems that happen in our world. And we think that's actually far worse. But secondly, because our side is far more sustainable because you can see role models from those texts continue to fight the problem. And that is something that you're likely to follow if you're someone who believes in those texts. 
But the final thing to say is that it grants the ability to use many symbols from these pessimistic texts that mean you are able to use them to shorthand for many of the problematic things that exist in our world. That is in the way that people use Big Brother as a shorthand for government overreach from 1984. That's when people can point out the fact that problems do exist and they can see that through the texts that exist right now, people can look at them. Why is that so important in this debate? Because we think that what that looks like is that under our side, we can trigger real action occurring. That means that people finally turn up to the ballot box because they don't think the system will fix itself. That means that people turn up to protest because they realize the magnitude of the rights that are being denied to women and people all across the world. It means that when you see a corrupt politician, you see not you don't see it as a one-off problem. You see it as a problem that must be fixed by the institution, cannot get rid of that one politician and say that the day is over. You have to continue fighting for real change. And that's what we get under our side. I'm going to move on to my second argument now. But before that, I'm happy to take a point. No, I'll continue with my second argument. How does this affect readers suffering? Because given the reality, the problems that do exist, that is we pointed out in the first argument, we say that it's abhorrent for opposition to deny and patronize those sufferings, tell them that their problems can be easily solved when in reality they can't. There are three parts to this argument. The first is to recognize that many people in the police, these political systems are treated incredibly unfairly and there's no remorse for them in the status quo. That is in Turkey, three quarters of the world journalists are in prison. That, but, but second, that abortion is being taken away in places like the US and women's rights are being constantly stripped back. That is the reality that exists right now. And this is what opposition has to confront and look at that through rose tinted glasses even though that is something that's incredibly abhorrent. But the second part of this is to say that people who read these texts and are told optimistically that they are solved easily are incredibly uh, suffer under that side for the reason that they're told that it can be solved easily when in reality they can't. It means that people are told that, that these problems, that it's their fault that they haven't fixed these problems yet and they therefore are not doing enough to help themselves. That is incredibly patronizing, but more so it is harmful to the mental health of those people who are told that it's their fault that they haven't found a solution yet. The final part of this argument is to recognize why you must weigh this so heavily. But before that, I'll give this opposition one last chance to take a point. No? Okay. On to the final part of this argument. Recognize why this is so important. Because we say that any of opposition's material which they might try and claim about happiness uh, from this fiction is unlikely to be particularly unique because you can still read optimistic text from another from non-political text, but instead just pure fiction like sci-fi. Whereas under our side, the specific harm that occurs to people from their experiences of suffering are incredibly important. That is, a woman being told they ha that they haven't done enough to continue fighting for their rights when something can be solved in one episode of TV. That is incredibly harmful to them, and that is something that this opposition has to recognize. To the extent that they do not, that is not only a specific harm, which only comes from these pessimistic texts, sorry, from these optimistic texts, but also we think that any of the benefits they try and claim in terms of optimistic texts, in terms of making people, people feel happy, clearly are not exclusive to this debate. At the end of this speech, what do you know? At the end of this speech, optimism reads apathy. It is only under, under our side where you get real change from the people who are suffering. The people realize the problems and the magnitude uh, of them that actually causes them to take action. And that's what happens under our side. Project close. I thank the leader of opposition for their fine speech. Uh, is the panel ready? Can we proceed? Amazing. Thank you. Uh, so everyone's ready. I call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to present the speech, not exceeding eight minutes. Here, here. Okay, can you hear me? I start in three, two, one. Dear partner, there are actually two main uh, points that we have to analyze before entering my constructive to show you that actually the opposition team is lacking today under our analysis of the motion. Indeed, when we are talking about pessimistic politics fiction, we're actually talking about series TVs, uh, movies, books, and that actually have to spread a message in which there's a problem, an issue to fight. But on the other side, actually, we cannot only report the problem without taking consideration that actually not in all the parts of the world, the possibility to produce and to report and to spread also and to publish a, a political uh, fiction that actually is negative would help also the population in those countries. Indeed, we have to take into consideration that actually uh, when we, talk, we are talking about, for example, a negative politi politics fictions, we have to take into consideration that maybe people would be less encouraged to challenge issues and also the writers or the publishers would have less opportunities to report problems into the worldwide audience. 
I think that's actually very important to analyze on the other side of the question, the, the, the example brought by the first speaker of opposition when he was talking about 1984. Indeed, we have to take into consideration that actually George Orwell was an English writer that was criticizing through a negative, a negative uh, a point of view the uh, the Russian uh, political government, politic government, that was actually something different to report and to criticize, for example, a problem and political issues that is written by, for example, a, a writer inside its own countries. For this reason, we think that it's actually very important to prevail and to have more political uh, good fictions that because they actually would have the opportunity to report in a different way the possibility, all the issues inside a country without being, uh, without being uh, opposed by the censor censorship, for example. Let's take another important and relevant example about, for example, the Chinese uh, government. Actually, the Chinese fantasy books uh, sometimes, which are hidden beneath something that actually describes a world in which there are politicians that tries to make something different and they have different laws, rules, and citizens are sometimes struggling, but at the same time, they have opportunity and the resilience to face the problems without uh, openly criticizing them to the fact that when we are talking about negative politics fictions, usually we are trying to make uh, something that actually is very uh, clear to, to describe. The fact that actually, for example, the politics, the, the politicians, the, the, the buildings in which politics exercise actually are demonized and are described as the worst part of the world in which where the problems uh, are created and spread. Uh, for this reason, we think that actually fiction are still increasing their popularity among the audience all over the world due to the fact that they are they're very limited, which makes them as likely as possible to happen in reality. Both books and movies um, are made by script writers who have the main purpose to attack only through the exaggeration, no thank you, of cha characters in events and to exploit their outrage and only toward the characters themselves, but also the role that the characters covers. The proposition team believes that more negative political fiction than positive could be an issue for our society because the negative political fiction may not be based on reliable and true facts, and their purpose may not be to inform people who watch them, but to exploit their inner instincts and in representing politicians and diplomats as dark, mysterious, and negative moments. Indeed, negative politician fiction are merely based on these two main features, which are extremely important to give to them the opportunity to reach as many people as possible. However, we should take into account the bond created between the audience and the plot for two main reasons. The first one is actually negative politician fictions are based on fictional elements and events cannot be taken as reliable depiction of disturbed reality, for example, in which specific crimes and misconducts are organized in a plot in which casualties and plot twist brings, brings to always the worst possible scenario. And the second main point is that the main purpose is to exploit inner instincts of the audience, which are embodied by politicians. And the certain of corrupted and colluded politicians becomes more popular and the audience would get used to recognize mechanically that a politician will be always like the double man, for example, in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We cannot, we cannot bring to the table this type of fictional, uh, fictional representation in which actually everything is always bad and there's nothing to do to, to solve the, the issue. Due to the fact that also when we are only criticizing without uh, proposing something that actually is positive and has the opportunity to construct, to build something new, actually we are only criticizing without, without having the opportunity to bring to the table something that actually would implement situation inside and outside, for example, our country, in which actually there's a political issues. And for this reason, going on to the comparatives, and then I take the PUI, if we compare three main actually uh, strategic keywords inside a political fiction, on our side with positive political fiction that actually are preferable for us, characters are not for sure perfect self-made men, but at the same time, they will not automatically be recognized as negative features, like happens on the other side when we're talking about negative political fiction, due to the fact that characters are described as corrupted, dark, and with a criminal-like behavior the most of the time. And then the second important point on the comparatives is that actually the political buildings, like for example, a, president, a presidential palace, 
are considered and represented as the symbol of progress and the protection of the citizens in our case. While on the other side, if we prefer to bring to the table and to go forward with this negative uh, view of the question, the political buildings are, for example, seen as the hell hidden to the people, where, where the power is exercised without the possibility to know actually what empires for the people. And then the third main point is that actually politics itself recalls the core value that stands at the basis of democracy, for example, in our side of the house, while on the other, politics is heavily put under pressure by a controversial description that makes it look like the gravitational center of corruption, right. criminality, and sins. It is described like something that takes control over the men and the women that try to exercise it. So how we how could we fight, for example, in our political issues when we are the first one that attacks actually the role, the body, which has the opportunity in the issues and also the burden to fight the problem? It does not make sense because we are and somehow we are condemning politics and its role that actually is not perfect. But at the same time, we try to, as the opposition team is proposing, we are trying to uh, depict, it, depict, it, depict, it, it, depict it as the problem and then also as the possibility to solve the issues itself. But actually it cannot work because it would be uh, controversial. For this reason, what stands at the basis of this debate is not the role that the political fiction has in reporting facts and stories, but in the way it's done, it is done. And when we choose to prefer a negative point of view, we are somehow investing the opportunity to exploit inner instincts of people that which would be sure shift to the figure of politician that actually will not have the opportunity also to be represented as the men, as the women uh, that would have the opportunity to face the problem and then try to find a solution that would actually implement uh, uh, the situation for all the citizens in a country. But they would be uh, at the same time the responsible and uh, the ones that actually would have the burden to solve the situation under a political point of view. And actually, this is a, a controversial fact that cannot be uh, proposed by the position team due to the fact we are not going to, to show that actually politics is not always, is not always bad, but uh, has also very positive views that actually can help us to implement it to make our work better. Thank you. Thank the Deputy Prime Minister for their fine speech. Uh, is the panel ready to proceed? Amazing, thank you. Uh, so that's the case. I call upon the Deputy Leader of Opposition to present their second speech. Here, here. Am I audible and visible? Yes, you are. Perfect. Uh, once again, QIs in the chat, please. I'm going to do three things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to prove why these stories are representative of the world as it is and why that is crucial in this debate. Second, I'm going to prove why these stories bring about greater mobilization and change. And then finally, I'm going to bring you a substantive contribution about how we get better and more representative art and why that is an alternate path to victory for us. On the first question, are these stories representative of the world? They make two big claims here. Firstly, they say pessimistic stories don't have morals. This is empirically and structurally untrue. Point to the fact that in order to pursue a certain storyline, these authors often have to take moral stances. The thing to note is in what context they pursue these morals. That is, like being the underdog and being willing to like exist in a system even though you are different. Being willing to create some sort of change even if you don't actually access it. Those are all incredibly important moral stories that exist structurally within these stories, and it's just an empirical observation that we can make. They do have takeaways. Second, they say they stereotype and exaggerate. 
Firstly, we think we reject this in and of itself. Just because things are uncomfortable doesn't mean they are untrue. Recognize the nature of the status quo. That is, when Margaret Atwood writes, like, writes The Handmaid's Tale, she observes that every single thing she, that includes in that story is taken from, the re taken from the status quo, right? She made absolutely nothing up in that book about how women were treated, but actively took examples from different regimes and different societies. It is empirically untrue, although uncomfortable, that these stories are representative of what the status quo looks like. Set point, secondly, point to the fact that uh, 1984 is just a representation of what communist society looks like. But secondly, even if it is an exaggeration, that is to pursue a very simple artistic message, which is to say, to exaggerate things to get people invested, to get people reading, to get people watching, to get people to understand how it connects to their life. Obviously, it is like, difficult for individuals to connect with make-believe characters in a make-believe place. But if you can exaggerate things to a point where they can connect with them and it is representative of something they recognize in their own life, that is how you get individuals to buy into these stories. Why is this incredibly important when weighing this round? Firstly, because Side Italy notes there is an imperative for truth. We would tell you that these are the most truthful stories because they represent the horrors and the uncomfortable truths of the status quo. But secondly, we would tell you there is a benefit in immortalizing these stories. These are individuals who have experienced huge plight in different societies under different regimes. It doesn't need to be true that every single woman has existed in a society that Margaret Atwood would write about. It just matters that they've experienced plunder, they've experienced an unjust world, they deserve to have that experience immortalized through text. Secondly, it's through a platform. That is, there is an accessibility of the story and there is a catharsis for victims who can share what they have had happen to them or they can share what, what, what needs to be changed about the world, which means regardless of immobilization, regardless of either side can actually prove that we make the world a better place, we win this debate on the fact that we tell the truth, we make individuals informed about the nature of the status quo and the benefits of that are principally important in and of themselves. Second question then, which side brings about mobilization and change? They make one big claim here. All of their benefits underlie an assertion that these stories encourage hopelessness. That is, that the apathy that results from an unwillingness to act and a disinterest in any further action. Why is this untrue? Structurally, we would tell you that apathy stems from comfort. That is, you are only apathetic if you are complacent in the world around you. Let's compare them stories. Firstly, note that these optimistic stories always have a positive revolution, resolution. That means that individuals, when they consume this media, always think that things are going to work out. That is how you get comfort. That is how you get complacency. But second, there is an anger and a frustration in the stories we tell. A frustration in the fact that you can recognize that this character is experiencing something that you experience and that is unjust, that is illegitimate. Why is this incredibly important? Firstly, because it just means that we get less apathy, but even and we get less hopelessness. But even if some experience hopelessness, why can we still win this debate? Because firstly, it is hopelessness in a specific condition. Simply because you can't solve the problem in, an, in its entirety doesn't mean you can't take specific actions to get there. That is to say, no social movement is trying to like dis like disassemble things like racism or sexism. They're trying to make simple changes in order to change that world. You don't need to have belief that you can change everything. You just have to have belief that some change is sufficient. No, that is what underlies most of these stories, that individuals can make an impact even though that they are one. Let's compare action then. That is, if you assume that you can get change under both sides, and we don't think you can because they are more likely to, to foster complacency and things like that, why can we still win this round? Firstly, because there is a greater investment in the cause. That is because, firstly, you have a relatable connection to these characters. Their only response is to say that they are bad, they're, they're corrupt. Obviously, that is a mischaracterization. Some characters within these stories are, but they are not the ones you connect to. Those are not the ones you are positioned to fight for and who, those who you want to do well. Obviously, Big Brother isn't a great actor, but the fact that you read about Winston and you're like, wow, I really want that guy to succeed. In fact, my life is similar to his. I probably experienced similar plights. You are fighting for that guy. He's not bad. He's not corrupt. These the characters exist, that's not the point. Secondly, uh, we get commitment. That is important because what exists in these optimistic stories is a narrative which says there's a big problem, but there is a very easy solution. That is structurally inevitable within these stories because they need to be marketable, they need to be accessible, they need to be somewhat short. It is impossible for a story written by George Orwell to like deal with how to take down capital, uh, take down communism in every way. But obviously, they, they're going to take the easy way out in terms of finding an easy solution. This is incredibly important because it means individuals, when they attach themselves to these movements and they get mobilized and do not receive that happy change, happy, easy change, because actually the status quo is one that's far more difficult, they're more likely to opt out of the system because they think it is not as easy as they like uh, others tell them that it is, so they're less likely to be engaged. 
their only response is to say there's an exploitation because finding solutions isn't that easy. That is like literally what we stand for under our side. Optimize it, uh, uh, optimistic stories ultimately trivialize the issues that these people face. Note there the principled harm that exists. That's something we told Toby that, that wasn't adequately responded to. The fact that how it is incredibly dehumanizing if you tell an individual that actually the fact they live in an unjust world is not because of structural like systems that need to be broken down, but because they haven't taken an easy step. We would tell you that easy step is not one always accessible, but it is under our side at the point at which we can mobilize people to make specific changes. Uh, I'll take a POI if you have one. If not, I'll move on. What is for you the difference, the real difference between positive political fiction and negative political fiction? Positive political fiction is one where the system itself fixes itself. That is, all of those stories have a, like an, an ending without a huge structural change, point to other stories which necessitate individuals from the outside actively coming in and changing that system. That is the fact that 1984, Big Brother isn't broken down from within, it needs an external change, point to things like the Soviet, uh, to the like, uh, fall of the Soviet Union that is representative of what that external change looks like. Finally, on their claim about CCP censoring, obviously that is outside of the debate, given that neither side can actively change what censored governments are willing to do. It is not a fair burden to set on us that we need to like get stories through that communist or dictatorial governments are likely to benefit. What do you know that at the end of this clash? We get people easier mobilized, we get better change, that's enough. One point of substantive then, how we get better, more representative art. Some of the most effective and important art is that which describes the world as it is. Why do we get more of this art under our side? Firstly, because there is a norm which says art is valid and art is legitimate, if it, uh, and it can be if it criticizes the status quo and if it tells the story like it is, that, that there is an audience for this art. Secondly, that artists are more likely to create this fiction because they know this audience exists, but thirdly, that accessibility in terms of distribution is also easier. Why is this important? Firstly, just the simple aesthetic benefit that more people get their stories told, that is a net good. Second, the catharsis and connection that comes about from this, different communities being able to share their political experience through means such as the art which is more accessible to them. Thirdly, the commentary and discussion which exists on the establishment itself. That is, it is much easier to talk about the White House uh, when you have the connection of art, which which like condenses it into a message that is accessible. At the end of this round, we gave individuals what mattered, the truth, up to uh, that was most important, we oppose. Flash thoughts, besides uh, the you're still unmuted. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No worries, thank you. Um, okay, I thank the deputy leader of opposition for their fine speech. Uh, and if the panel is ready to proceed. Fine, amazing, thank you. Uh, I call upon the government whip to present their speech. Here, here. Do you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Okay, perfect. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Uh, by first starting my speech, I would like to um, to uh, express what the other team has misunderstood. Uh, in my POI, I have, I have shown that the other team that didn't really understand the crucial difference between positive political fiction and negative political fiction. A positive political fiction may report, as they say, a social, sexist, racist, classist problem whilst also solving it. Whilst a negative political fiction reports it and tells you that nothing can be done about it. That is the crucial difference. If we have a political, uh, positive political fiction, it tells you that something can always be done to solve problems, whilst a negative one will always tell you that you cannot do anything. If we think about 1984, we see that Mr. Smith wasn't able to um, to um, fight against and to defeat the regime, to the big brother, but eventually had to submit to it. The opposition team argued that pessimistic and negative political fiction creates action, stimulates a will to change things. That is simply not true. They misunderstood the meaning of, neg of negative political fiction because just as political fiction, it shows and reports a problem that afflicts the social uh, society uh, politically. The difference between positive and negative is that a positive political fiction has what we call a happy ending. And uh, the characters actually succeed in fighting the problem. Instead, negative political fiction ends with the impossibility of solving the problem. Not even hope remains. And that hope is a, is a crucial, important word. Let us think, uh, as I said, about uh, 1984. Uh, at the end, Winston Smith conforms to the regime without being able to fight against it, forgetting even his love for Julia, without being able to fight against it, forgetting um, 
uh, uh, enhanced the story and in fact with a pessimistic negative outcome where people are left disillusioned and without hope. How can Optim assert that these kind of fiction works stimulate action when they actually let us understand how deeply corrupted our system may become? We see the potential of negative, uh, of negative political fiction. And we told that since the beginning, we said that it's important to have both of the two. We see how crucial and how vital negative political fiction is because it tells the problems. And it tells that not always we win against, against problems, but we think that we must have a majority of positive political fiction because we believe that only in that way we will be able to form a society in which problems are, are tackled and which people have hope and which people act to do what they believe in. Instead, in their world, in which a uh, negative political fiction prevails, we have people that are without hope. They do not know how to respond to problems because they see that in the majority of cases, things don't go as they should, that uh, it is impossible to succeed, that the good always fails. But that is not a, a message that we want to promote. We want to have a society in which people are uh, actually able to change things. And the other team is telling you the same thing, telling that a negative political um, fiction can do the same, but it actually cannot, because negative political fiction shows that nothing can be done, and they didn't even understand that. So how can they win this debate? Um, so another thing that they uh, misunderstood, that they, uh, that they uh, mistaken, is that they say that fiction can be true. They criticized my second speaker, telling that uh, he uh, did not um, demonstrate that fiction is something that um, is uh, actually uh, false, but fiction is for itself something that is created by the mind of a, uh, an author. So we cannot say that fiction is reality. Orwell, of course, inspired himself on reality, but we cannot say that 1984 was actually something that happened because it was a, a work of art. So we, we, what we want to say is that, uh, and what we have demonstrated actually, is that if we have a message, if we have a fiction work, we actually are uh, even exaggerating some details that may cause in the reader uh, some ideas that are not actually true, that did not actually happen. We are not talking about documentaries, historical documentaries, we're talking about fiction. And for example, many uh, many conspiracy conspiracy theories uh, were based on the fact Point. that they, uh, I'll take that in a moment, uh, were based on the fact that exploit books such as 1984 to assert that their institutions were systematically lying to them. You cannot possibly say that this is not a risk of negative political fiction. You can go. Obviously, this is fiction. Fiction can still mimic reality. It can still tell stories that matter. Why isn't that sufficient? No, well, that is sufficient. We, we think that fiction can tell things that matter. And, it's, and in fact, we are producing both negative and positive fictions. We are, uh, in, and we think that a majority of positive fiction is better than a, um, a majority of negative fiction. But we believe that uh, negative political fiction may also have uh, a way of seeing the world that is not always true. And as I have just said, conspiracy theorists used 1984 to say that uh, countries lie to them systematically, but that is not always true. You cannot say that just because you read that in a book, uh, that is your mindset and that you see everything that way. But that is a risk of negative, of negative political fiction. But, and political fiction uh, that is positive or negative can show a problem. And uh, the difference, as I've said many times, is that a positive uh, political fiction shows you how to solve the problem, whereas the other says that you cannot solve the problem. So uh, why do we win uh, this debate? Why? Um, how, what do we, have we understand that they did not? Is that the fact that um, the, the true problem is that the negative political fiction has of course, some uh, some things that are good for society, but it has many limits. And to overcome these limits, we need to have a majority of positive um, political fictions, because only in this way we can have the, both the good things and cover and overcome the limits of the two things. So we believe that the negative political fiction produce in the society uh, some 
risks, for example, uh, it exaggerates some details, it extremizes uh, some political views. And so it also tells people how to interpret some uh, reality, some situation in the reality, and may orient them in a negative way of uh, interpreting them. Whilst a positive, a positive uh, political fiction uh, allows you to understand the problem and also to uh, have the hope, the will to strive to change it, to have the, uh, the force, the strength to do something. And that is what misses in the negative political fiction. And that is what the other team didn't understand. Because if we do not have the hope, how can we change things? You cannot say that a negative political fiction gives you hope. It just gives you sadness. It tells you that the world cannot be changed, that us humans are actually the, the worst animal of the world, if we think about Orwell's works. But we do not have to show only this side of the problem. We have to show even the positive side. We have to give hope to people if we want actually to succeed in fighting these problems. So we are a team that actually solves the problems because we have both the advantages of the positive and negative political fiction, and we also overcome the limits. The other team is that is only uh, getting the worst part and is only having the negative risks and consequences of a majority of negative political fiction. Thank you. I thank the government with for the high speech. Uh, and if the panel is ready, uh, you can analyze it. Thank you. Um, then I call upon the, the opposition whip to deliver their speech. Here, here. I'm assuming that everyone can hear me. If not, please signal. Um, I'll take my POIs in the chat just for clarity. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Optimism breeds apathy and pessimism breeds action. There was a reason why women who were protesting the lack of abortion rights throughout the world used the habit from Gilead as a signal of their oppression. There was a reason why people who were protesting the poor treatment of the vast bulk of the American lower classes, while the rich allowed for tax exemptions, used the phrase, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. It was because literature and art that reflected upon the problems of the societies that we lived in were not only dealing with reality, they were dealing with change, and it was on those grounds that we took this debate. I'm going to ask three questions in this speech. The first is a question of setup, just clarifying what this debate is about, and therefore what burdens are on each team. Then I'm going to bring a question of what does this world look like, but we've had a lot of pushback from side Italy. And thirdly, on the most important clash, is about who best fixes social change in regards not only to action, but who can provide solace to those who need it. On the first question about setup, we give you from first who things which will distinguish an optimistic text from a pessimistic text. Because optimistic texts need you on net be more happy than pessimistic by the very nature of their name. This means any problem they point to in the political institutions at the moment must be solved within 300 pages or within a season. That is inherent to the nature of them, which means either these institutions solve themselves or people solve them, but it is so easy and quick to do that it is no longer compelling a problem. Noting once more, all their analysis about why optimistic art, art has morals while pessimistic art doesn't, why optimistic art has nice characters, pessimistic art doesn't, clearly does not deal with the actual framework in which this debate stands. Therefore, moving on, the definition that you must use to adjudicate this debate is whether art that is on net, to, like pointing in an optimistic direction, art that proves that political issues can be solved quite easily, is better than those who prove the reality. Moving on from there, the question of what this world looks like. We've had interesting pushback from Italy about what the actual state of the world is right now. They tell us that we are no longer living in medieval times. Like, okay, but the world is still a pretty bad place. 
We would say it is nothing but offensive to suggest that the world is okay when the US Supreme Court, apparently the bastion of democracy and equality, just took away women's rights to abort a child even if they're about to die, that they're now considering whether gay people should be able to marry the person they're in love with when democracy continues to backslide and genocides continue to happen. It is insufficient to say that is not the world we are dealing with. Three points that you therefore have to weigh this debate on. First of all, we think therefore, because we have proven such a big problem in the status quo, that any kind of art that truthfully reflects on this is the art you must prioritize. Secondly, even if it is an exaggeration at their best case, we still think that it brings people buy-in. So for example, we are not pigs, but the message of Animal Farm is still important to people. You don't have to live in a world in which the government literally has a flag around your throat to not think that their overreach is important. And third of all, even if you think the world is perfect, I take these messages as still important. Because if people being slightly skeptical of a government that starts to increase their powers, this is a perfect government is probably a good thing because devolving into the states that we see in these books is something that is not a good thing we never want at the end of that point you know the world is in a pretty bad place and even if it isn't what, we, what is important is stopping it from getting there in the first place now i'm going to prove why we're the only side that achieves this the main push we hear from side italy here is to say that negative political fiction denies solutions Two responses. First of all, they never made it clear why you need a solution in a text to believe that you should do action. For example, as I flagged in my introduction, the symbol of Gilead of the habit, people using that in protest, 1984 making people angry, it doesn't mean that they now think that they shouldn't both engage in politics if that's the reason they're protesting. I'm going to uh, illustrate this in the way that it actually works in a trade-off, because art that shows that problems are massive, that must contend with the fact that perhaps they deal with less solutions, because as I flagged, like solving the problems in the Middle East, like the West Wing does in like three episodes, does not make sense. Those solutions are the things that minimize the problem and therefore minimize the will of people to take action. It is on those grounds that even if you do not provide a solution, you have an intention to act. This is in reason that people, if they are in dictatorial states who are being abused by the government, are in a spot where they are most likely to have a revolution to mass mobilize. That is why when people are faced with massive challenges, young people don't think climate change is going to be solved in the next decade it does not mean they don't act it is providing a compelling reason to act that is the way that action actually happens then therefore let's deal with how optimistic texts work so italy claims they breed hope and therefore action three responses first of all Having hope that it, uh, you'll be able to solve problems in the Middle East in the foreseeable future through one conference is not a good thing if that hope can easily be dashed. Having hope that these problems can be solved quite simply rather breeds apathy, because if there is not a problem that seems so grand, almost insurmountable, there is no longer a need or imperative for you to do anything in the first place. And thirdly, note the way that we must bring to hope, because obviously if you have more texts that are quite hopeful, people have less connection to them than if they are scary. That is to say, fear is a pretty big motivator. That is the reason why Italy says that it's like you're upon people's instinct. That is the reason why text, texts always have a challenge in the middle of them, because that's what makes them interesting. That's what makes you want to think about that character and to empathize with them. Therefore, on that basis, what is most important is proving there is an issue and proving there is a, that there is such a problem as if a need to solve it actually exists. I'll take a POI if you have one. If not, all good. Now, moving on to why we therefore are able, thirdly able to uh, give solace to those who are currently suffering at the moment. What we bring here is firstly, the optimistic art is incredibly patronizing. That is to say, by simplifying solutions, they make it seem like if only there was a conference about the Middle East, it wouldn't have been this bad. If only one woman decided to protest and knock at a parliamentarian's door, that it therefore would have stopped. That is incredibly condescending. What we say rather is to reflect on a world which is quite pessimistic, that is quite a good thing. And note, even if that is a small number of people, providing solace to those number of people, providing catharsis to those who are being screwed over by the system is a pretty important thing in the context of this debate. At the end of that clash, what are we likely to see? We think that negative political fiction, although it must deny solutions by Isai Italy's definition, is a world which presents a problem that is necessary to be solved. It is seeing that problem, seeing it as something that needs to be solved, seeing something that has such an insight 
insurmountable imperative that doing nothing is not an option is the way that art makes the world seem like a world in which you must protest. And that was the most important metrics on which to judge this debate. Because if more people were showing up to protest because they were scared of the government invading their privacy all the time, that was a world in which the government itself was scared of invading their privacy all the time. Because a world in which people, the women of the US, are scared of themselves turning into Gilead is a world in which they are more likely to vote against the Republican Party that wants to see a shift to Christian theocracy. At the end of this debate, make no mistake, the world is suffering, people are suffering, and change is necessary. The only side that gives people enough of an imperative to act is a side of pessimistic art that shows them the truth of the world, and a world, even if it is not there quite yet, will devolve into it quite soon. It was on those grounds we win this debate, because once again, optimism breeds apathy, pessimism breeds action we oppose. And the opposition whip for concluding the constructive part of this debate. Uh, and if, if the panel is ready, uh, can we proceed? Yeah, okay. Um, so if everyone's ready, I call upon the opposition reply speaker to conclude the debate for team opposition. Here, here. Am I audible? Yes, you are. There are two questions in this reply. First, who helps politics more? And second, who is better for the readers who are suffering? First, who helps politics more? And I'm starting with this because it's the clearest way for us to win the debate, because it explains why in a world where politics is imperfect and incredibly problematic, and that is a reality this opposition must face, our side is the only one that is able to deal with their problem. Because they start this debate with a bit of a red herring by saying that politics doesn't have the same problems we point out. But we point out the fact that abortion rights are being stripped away in the US. We point out the fact that many politicians are corrupt. We point out the fact that many states are pretty close to being totalitarian. That is a harm that this opposition must face. And this notably deals with a key claim on truth, because it explains why our side is actually the one that represents our reality. But even if you don't believe that's true, given that that problem exists, our side is the only one that's able to adequately deal with it. Because change is something that is necessary. We give you three mechanisms on the ways that it works. Firstly, that it recognizes the problem's magnitude. That is only when you're able to get people to protest, the ways that people actually act rather than stand by and allow things to happen. Secondly, we explain that readers attach to role models who continue to fight, which is exactly why they will continue to do under our world. But thirdly, because we explain that we have the ability to use symbols from these texts, to say things like big brother, point out things that are all well in, in the status quo, and use that to gather emotions to fight back. What is their response? The only response here is to talk about hopelessness. We give you four things down the bench. The first is that we explain is that this actually creates more impetus to act, not total hopelessness, but second, we explain that because protagonists continue to fight, readers will follow that because they have that emotional connection. But third, we explain that it doesn't mean that there's inherent hopelessness, but it means that you're suspicious of the actions under the status quo, that you're able to take off the rose-tinted glasses and look at the world as it is, the dark modern modernity that often fails us. But finally, we explain that the absence of a solution in a text does not mean that there is no solution at all, which is to say that simply because it does not happen in that specific text, doesn't mean that you as an individual can't do anything, that you can't turn up to protest, that you can't choose to vote and make that even a slight bit better from the darkness that exists. And note, this is clearly what this debate must be weighed on, because this is the highest impact. Because it's only under our world where we turn that apathy into action, where we get people to turn up to the ballot box because they know the problems that exist and they know what they must do. To not turn a blind eye to the problems in politicians, the problems in politics, and walk away with blind faith. To turn up to protests because they know that is the way that they'll be able to garner action and be able to create the action that will save ourselves. Any benefit we get here is clearly better than all opposition who does literally nothing to the people who are suffering right now. That is clearly the metric by which this debate must be judged on. Even if we don't solve the problem, 
clearly it is better than this opposition who has not been able to give a reason why people are likely to do uh, or likely to take specific actions when they can say that the world is already fixing itself when they can say that the world is something that's going to be fine if you do nothing so the second question in this debate is who is better for readers and this is important because this goes almost entirely unresponded to by this opposition because we explained all down the bench that the most suffering right now are told patronizingly that their problems are easy to solve that the war in the middle east can be solved in three episodes of the west wing the women, if they tried a bit harder, they could fix the structural problems of discrimination that they face each and every day. That is the exact sort of thing that opposition tells the most oppressed right now. We tell you that from first. And understand the way here, because any benefit they want to claim in terms of optimism is clearly outweighed by the unique harm that they bring to this special set of people who is now forced to relive and suffer over and over under their world without people realizing recognizing the suffering that they have had, meaning that even if you buy that there is some benefit of optimistic text, we have pointed out that you can have optimism outside of political text, which grants that same benefit, but the suffering that this opposition brings is one that is specific and unique. At the end of this debate, this opposition throws a false strand of hope into the wind for it to be crushed by the iron fist of reality. Optimism breeds apathy, pessimism creates action, and that's what we stand for. And the opposition reply speaker, and if everyone's ready, I call upon the proposition reply speaker to conclude the entire debate. Here, uh, am I audible? Yeah, all fine. Okay. Dear panel, the core issue of this debate stands in the controversial problem to prefer positive political fiction than negative ones. It is not a debate about protests, about abortion, about women's rights in America, about genocide, about Middle East. That is what the opposition talked for much of their time. Talking about things that matter, both sides of the house actually agreed on the fact that political issues actually exist and must be challenged. But what makes the two sides different in the, is the role that both positive and negative political fiction have. The three main clashes of the debates are, the first, the role that the negative and the positive fiction have. The second, how they, how they work and how they can uh, report political issues. And the third is that uh, how the impacts on, on the society are which basically the audience for which the fiction is made. Starting so from the first, the, so the first, so the role that fiction has. On our side of the house, we have proved to you that the negative fictions tend to criticize openly a political issues, but at the same time, they are created in order to exploit the inner sense of the audience who gets used to recognize in politicians, politics, and institutions, not the tool to exploit the soul of the, the situation, but the evil part of the system to destroy. Furthermore, we have proved to you that actually bans positive political fictions spread among the audience a positive message in which politicians, politics, and institutions are demonized, but the, not demonized, but depicted as common people, uh, as common things, with their problems to overcome, but also with the strength to face problems for which they have been voted by people. On the other side of the house, on opposition, opposition tells us that negative political fictions have been depicted as the universal a solution to all the polit political and issues uh, social spread within the world, but without taking into consideration that the negative po political fictions are less likely to be published and spread in all those countries where the problem actually exists. That is caused by the presence of the censorship and the excessive aggressive attitude that the authors lead towards the political system itself, which should be the protagonist which has the burden to improve the environment. This last part leads us to the second main point of clash in this debate, how the positive and the negative political fictions report the political issues. On our side of the house, we firmly believe that by preferring negative fictions over positive ones, we should only make it more difficult to report political issues in the status quo. The main reason why it relies in the, may, in the way in which the two types of fictions approach a problem. The positive fiction uh, this pulls the censorship by presenting alternative words in which the problems are presented under a filter which allows the creator to not criticize directly who causes the issues. On the other hand, the negative political issues, uh, the negative political fiction uh, tends to make it more difficult to shift the problem on another level of narration. For example, making the censorship more easily to criticize and, eat and less likely to reach as many people as possible. The last point of clash 
deals with the impacts uh, that these two types of political fiction would have on the audience uh, for which it is created. On our side of the house, we have proved to you that the positive political fiction would have the advantage to report a problem, with, but at the same time giving to politics to be extorted uh, in its best ways and putting under the spotlight the core principles which are its pillars. Uh, on the other hand, negative fictions would only focus on the downside effects of policy, making, making it different uh, kind of primes and issues that only push people to lose confidence in the government and in the institutions, which are actually the ones on which the society should rely. In conclusion, dear panel, we cannot only justify the preference of negative political fictions because they have the main purpose to demonize and to present the problem under a, a sterker way. But what we should take into account is the way in which the political message would be vehicle to the audience. And as we have proved to you during the debate, preferring positive fictions to negative ones, we would achieve such a huge goal. For all of these reasons, I beg you to propose. Thank you. I thank all the speakers for what was an engaging debate, which was fun to watch. Uh, now you can stay in the room, shake hands, uh, socialize, since we're still not together, <laughs> find out about like the base in your countries. Uh, and if I could ask, yeah, also I would stop recording now. Uh,